So, um, we are more on the um, user side of the pipelines that have been discussed so far. So we work with data that is produced by NGS platforms. Um, but we are, uh, in ourselves, are also a service provider. So we are part of the uh, Swedish Bioinformatics Infrastructure for Life Sciences, which is a national resource that provides bioinformatics analysis services to users. So we are not generating data as such. We help people analyzing the data, which is another kind of big and upcoming field in bioinformatics. So there's a lot of groups that have interesting questions, but not always do they have the competence in the team. And oftentimes it doesn't make sense to build up the competence because it's a very small part of what they are trying to accomplish. Right. So, BILS, as I said, is a bioinformatics infrastructure that is more on the user side of things. So we are a human e-cloud, as our uh, director calls it. We cover a range of different topics. NGS is a very big topic, proteomics, metabolomics, sequence analysis and development. So all of these things are covered by BILS. And the annotation platform is something that kind of emerged out of this, out of these uh, separate efforts to provide a kind of unified contact point for people that are interested in genome projects and that need help with uh, this core aspect of genome projects. So the annotation platform currently consists of three people, myself, uh, Jacques Denard and uh, Andreas Kehari. We are all by training bioinformaticians in one way or the other. Jacques and I are trained biologists who kind of move towards bioinformatics and Andreas is a computer scientist who's doing lots of our development work. Um, apart from personnel, we have um, hardware resources, so we have a custom HPC cluster that we build ourselves. When we started this project in late 2013, there was discussions of, come on, there are existing very good resources in Sweden, like the OpenX cluster, but we realized that the kind of work that we are going to do uh, I don't think there's even enough digits in the kind of project request form for OpenX to put in that many core, core hours that we are burning through every year, so it's like in the hundred thousands. Uh, that's why we decided we need our own system and storage. And we are also doing a lot of uh, web services, so OpenX currently doesn't have a real strategy, although now with the upcoming cloud services that, that might change, but we also needed web services that we can tightly integrate with our compute. Right, so genome sequencing, uh, now that we have these amazing X10 machines, but even before that, uh, is a very kind of uh, up and coming topic in, in uh, life sciences. Traditionally, these analyses tended to be focused on single genes. Now we are expanding, now we have technology. And the most powerful, that means genetically tractable model systems, have a genome sequence, starting with uh, yeast and now mouse, human. So these are becoming more and more readily available. A genome sequence has the great advantage that it provides context, so you're not only looking at individual genes. You can look at neighboring genes, what sort of regulatory sequences are present next to my gene of interest, and they allow us to do much more detailed comparative studies, so comparing different genomes, trying to find what do they have in common, what are their differences. And the main challenge initially was that it required very large teams and substantial funding to make this happen. Now that we have second and now third generation sequence technologies, uh, as Francesco said, data generation is not the problem anymore. We can easily generate a human genome sequence. That's not a challenge. The challenge becomes making sense of this genome sequence. Uh, it's a complex process. There's a fairly high entry barrier. There's a lot of different kind of disjoint tools and steps that need to be put together in order to kind of squeeze out the interesting bits out of a genome sequence. And as I said, so it has a steep learning curve. Uh, and the product in the end, so this is kind of... Uh, trying to visualize what it is that we are trying to accomplish with our, with our efforts. So basically, creating a genome sequence and then putting names to faces, trying to use available data that is either generated with the genome sequence or from public databases and trying to find where are the genes, what are their functions, what does the expression landscape and certain loci look like, and thereby providing the tools to researchers to kind of get to the bottom of their questions. So um, the annotation platform is um, essentially an infrastructure that provides three main services or has three main steps in our um, quest to find the proper gene models in a genome sequence. One starts with the data processing, and this is already a, one of the more challenging bits. So unlike, unlike the, my, uh, the other speakers today, we currently don't have a completely well-defined flow of data. So it's not that we have always the same data coming in, which would be fantastic, but uh, oftentimes it's so that 
um, research groups either get their sequencing data from different facilities, they have different budgets, so sometimes a genome project will have very good data, and sometimes it will have very poor data, and there's, for us, there's no way to anticipate what sort of data we will be confronted with. So we have a fairly complex data processing stage where we try to deal with whatever sort of data people throw our way. We have a gene building stage, which is kind of the main annotation stage, where we combine different available and self-developed tools that try to synthesize all the data that we get from the customer and from public resources, trying to find the best explanation, uh, the best gene structures that explain the data that we have. And finally, um, a stage that we call functional annotation. So once you have the gene structures, you want to be able to tell the customer what do, do these genes probably do, depending on what, what organism they are working with. If they are sequencing a primate, it's very easy, because we can just go to the next well annotated primate genome and say this is probably that gene. If they are working with some sort of obscure amoeba, it's a bit cha more challenging, of course. Right, and if that isn't enough, we also try to do services in the realm of comparative genomics, so we do genome alignments, we project annotations from one genome to the other to kind of give some sort of indication where um, autologous genes might be located, gene trees, and stuff like that. And finally, and this is kind of currently one of our main focus, uh, focus points, tools and web services, and the reason behind that is most people that we collaborate with are lab-based researchers. So if we give them a kind of a flat file with genome annotations, then they won't know what to do with that. So they, they need to be able to kind of look at, visualize data, combine different data in a visual form so that they can make sense of it. And that is why we spend a lot of time also exploring and developing new solutions for the data that we generate to make it available and usable by the customer in the end. Point. So um, pipelines uh, is kind of pedic critical to what we do. Each genome project, as I said, has a varying number of individual challenges, um, different sequencing technologies, different assembly approaches, but there's always a common set of processing steps that we can perform. Each of these processing chains needs to be documented and re repeatable. I guess that's kind of self-explanatory. And we also need to be able to, to kind of catch failures in these processing chains. It needs to be tracked and traceable, so we require some sort of audit trail. It needs to be robust and scalable. Scalable is very important for us because we are only three people currently and the number of genome projects is only growing. Uh, and as, as long as people don't give me more resources, we can basically have to cope with an increasing load with existing resources. So, and when, basically when we set out to develop this sort of annotation platform and the infrastructure for that platform, we knew that our resources would be limited, both in terms of personnel and compute. Um, we needed to develop pipelines that essentially uh, ticked a couple of boxes. It needed to be easy to develop and use. So we didn't want a solution that required a lot of kind of overhead in terms of getting simple things going. It should be more or less self-documenting running these pipelines, so they needed to be uh, self-reporting in that sense. We required some sort of robust failover. So if the pipeline failed, we needed to be able to tell easily what went wrong. And it needed to uh, use our compute resources in an efficient way, because that too was fairly limited. What we chose is B-Pipe, and I'm giving a lecture tomorrow on why we chose B-Pipe and what B-Pipe does. So some of you might have already used it, some don't. And kind of as a single sentence summary, B-Pipe is very easy to use. And that is essentially why we decided to go with B-Pipe. Right. So now I'm kind of briefly going through the different stages of our process and highlighting some of the pipelines or workflows within that larger context, trying to explain our rationale behind it. I'm, I'm going to use two color codes. One is green, that means that's automated. And the other thing is red, that's not automated. Um, partly because it can't be automated or partly we didn't have the time to do it yet. Right, so the first stage, as I said, is data processing. Some data is being given to us by the customer when the project is being started. And there's a couple of things then that we, that we usually do when we get project. The main focus, of course, in the pre-processing stages is the genome sequence. Can we work with that sequence? What do we need to do with, it, with that sequence to make it usable? And that kind of goes back to the problem not having one standardized pipeline for genome assembly. So people will either get it from SciLife and then we know sort of what to expect, then, or some might decide we do it ourselves, and then we have no clue what to expect. So basically we go through a couple of steps, starting with removing the tiny context, which people tend to leave in, but for annotation purposes are less than useless. 
uh, we need to flag or do certain sanity checks on the assembly. The, some assemblers will have trailing or leading ends, which are not accepted by the large genome databases. So we need to get, get rid of these things first. We need to make sure that we don't have organella context in our genome assembly, because these need to be annotated with different tools. They have a different genetic code, so our eukaryotic pipelines will work. And then we need to basically make sure, is this assembly with everything rem removed, is that still big enough to kind of uh, give us any chance of annotating it properly? Um, and then kind of, a, kind of a second check to that question is what we call, uh, what's called SEGMA. SEGMA is a tool that will look for the representation of the gene space in the assembly, so how much of the ultra-conserved eukaryotic genes are fully represented within that assembly. And that gives you a percentage score that gives you an idea of how complete is this assembly. And there, this, this, kind of, this question is currently still uh, dealt with in a manual way, because it depends a little bit on what the customer is after. Uh, if we had kind of one core deliverable, we could probably say if this is less than 70%, then we reject it, but that's not how it works. Basically, our, our aim is to give something to any customer. But it's anyway a quality check that we can do. So once we have done these quality checks, we will split the assembly in the individual contexts, and each of these basically gets farmed out to the cluster to predict non-coding RNAs on the per-contact basis. We also do some post-processing that is required for other pipelines, so we create a bow tie index to align read against, and we will model repeat sequences from the assembly, which we will also need for attention. So now we come to two of our, uh, one of our core manual steps, reference proteins. Proteins still have a fairly important place in, a, in annotation because they are the only source of uh, coding sequences for a genome. We can use RNA-seq to predict transcripts and within those transcripts try to find the most likely coding sequence. But if we have very closely related proteins, that, that task becomes much more easy. But these we have to manually select from available databases, applying very stringent criteria like needs to be full length, needs to be manually curated and so on. So we can't just rely on any sort of protein data. And that is sometimes a somewhat time-consuming process. RNA sequencing is one of the, or basically the key evidence that we have to work with. Um, we apply common RNA-seq pipelines to any data set, so we will do adapter trimming. We will align the reads against the genome currently we use for that top hat. We try to reconstruct the most likely transcript structure that explains the read alignments using cufflinks or more recently base sembler, which is a very new Bayesian-based uh, approach that has uh, shown us much better results in cufflinks. So if anyone's interested in that stuff, I'm happy to discuss it. Uh, we produce statistics and then we do formal conversions as they are required by the pipeline and uh, by the subsequent steps in our workflow. We'll also do de novo transcriptome assembly if needed. So if the genome sequence is suspected to be fragmented, we'll often annotate or assemble the transcripts also without the genome sequence in a de novo approach and compare basically to see does this still kind of, does it work, does it match, do we get better results from the normal, is there a problem with the genome sequence. So we don't do sanity checks in the sense, do we look for structural problems in the genome assembly. We need to trust a customer to do that, to, that, to, to, to do that for us, basically. Right, so that was data generation or processing. Then the core activity that we do is gene building, <coughs> which basically means we take all that data, we kind of throw it at the genome, see what sticks, and try to synthesize that into transcript structures. Um, the actual gene building is currently done by an external tool that's called Maker. Maker is attractive to us because other people develop it and it's completely NPI enabled, so we can scale it out to a thousand cores if we wanted to, uh, so we don't have to deal with that key aspect of annotation. But what we need to do is, um, a key aspect of Maker is essentially the, the, the aspect of predicting genes from the sequence directly. So it's called ab initio gene prediction, which is often done if you expect that your uh, sequence data that you have, be it RNA-seq or proteins, is incomplete. So if you were just to align the RNA-seq data, you wouldn't find any genes that are not expressed, for example, which is kind of the core, core idea behind RNA-seq. It's the expressed, actively expressed transcriptome. And if you don't have transcriptome data, say, from a certain gene, a developmental gene that only lights up during, during embryogenesis, and you need another complementary step to try to find these things. And these ab initio gene, tra uh, gene finders are trained on high quality gene sequences or transcript sequences, which we need to provide. That's another manual step. So basically what we do, we will select from an initial gene, gene build, we will we'll select all the models that fulfill a set of criteria. 
So they need to be full length in our, in our opinion, and this is all automated now. They uh, need to have a start and stop colon, so it cannot be a partial transcript. And once we have these things, we extract the peptide sequences from the predicted genes, we'll blast them against each other to remove any redundancy, so any genes that are more than 90% similar get removed. And that is important for the training of these Apinitia profiles, so they cannot be trained on redundant data. So this is this reciprocal start blast step. We remove all the redundant models, and the remaining models essentially get converted into the training format, in this case it's a gem bank format, uh, that gets then split into a training and a test data set and that we use to train the apprehension gene predictors. And then we go on with the final stages of gene building. Right, so once, once we have done this, so this is basically the biggest, time-wise, the biggest chunk of our, of our activities. So these things take between four and five days per, per round. This is a manual step which can take anywhere between, or this is a semi-manual step, I should say. This can take anywhere between one to two days. And these are, again, four to five days jobs on an average mammalian sized genome. And then we have the quality control, which is also semi-automated. So then the final step of the actual annotation is the functional annotation, so putting names to faces, trying to predict what these annotated genes might do. That's another of our pipelines currently. So basically, we take the gene models that we have predicted. We generate stable IDs that we need for, for database submission, for example. We extract peptide sequences from these gene models. We start partitioning them. So that, that is another thing how we can farm out our jobs to a cluster. So we will have around 25,000 genes, depending on what organism we annotate. And on this, these 25,000 genes tend to get split into 100 parallel jobs, which we can run on the cluster. We look for high similarity hits in the Uniprot database, but we also try to predict functional domains and similar from the Interpro scan database. This data then gets later merged for each chunk, creating one consensus, one large chunk merger, and then that data gets mapped to the gene models using a tool called ANI. Um, and those functions then get mapped, get, get added to the gene models, updated GFF file, and then basically we have the product that we would give to the customer. And this entire process, start to finish, takes about a month, depending on the size of the data sets and the, kind of the challenges that we face when we do the initial gene building, seeing kind of how well it worked, whether we need to tweak certain things. And the final thing that I wanted to talk about very, very briefly is this added value aspect, so the tools that we provide to customers. Um, as I said, most people have very little use of a flat file with coordinates and cryptic names, so they, they want to be able to look at this in the browser and so a lot of our activities focus now on uh, how can we provide this added value, how can we connect our data production pipeline with the um, user front end or the, the web-based tools that we have. Um, this is one example, this is called Web Apollo. Web Apollo is a manual creation tool, so we can provide the gene models and then the customers have uh, password protected access to this tool and can basically, in, within their group, look at the data, tweak the data, come back with feedback to us so that we can improve things as needed. So then as a closing remark, as I said, so we are currently focusing on annotation. BILS has other activities uh, focusing on genome assembly and RNA-seq analysis. So basically the, the, the battle plan for the future would be that this becomes even more automated and we are working on ways to do that. Uh, we can connect this with assembly efforts either on the side of SciLife, so SciLife has assembly efforts. BILS has a dedicated team to do genome assembly. On the other hand, transcriptomics, we're currently keeping within annotation, but there's certainly added value in kind of creating a specialized group that works on transcriptomics. Variation data, as uh, Francesco has kind of shown now. Comparative genomics is one thing that we simply, based on personnel, can't deal with as well as we would like to. And essentially connecting all these things to create an integrated <coughs> service within genomics and then making all, all this information available through a range of different platforms and tools. Right, so, so basically the goal is towards a fully automated workflow as much as that's possible. Remaining challenges are integrating a wide range of data from often varying sources. So if all our data came from SciLife sequencing platforms and every customer had the same budget, this would be a non-issue, but of course that's not the truth. 
Um, further eliminate need for human intervention. That's kind of an ongoing process as we try to scale towards the demand uh, with the resources that we have. Uh, bringing together the expertise in one team. So we are three people. We have a, fair, a, a fairly broad range of, of skills, but of course there's things like web development where we really kind of have no, not a whole lot of clue. So we are hoping to uh, recruit a web developer during 2015. And then kind of nailing down the set of core deliverables, which kind of shifts from project to project because each group has different interests. But having a set of core deliverables makes it so much easier to develop good pipelines and workflows, of course. Right, so enough, enough of that. If you have any questions, either now or later. I'm sure you have a lot of questions to, uh, to mark. So one, one question, yeah. Yes, for the uh, workflow execution, because I, I noticed about the uh, uh, execution times and I think in some cases it is quite long so do you have the data stored in, in one file system and then the cluster is working on another file system or the cluster and the data are in the same file system that's the same file system so um, it's, a, it's a high performance file system so we have a, a 10 node cluster with 160 cores and they and then um, so they are basically directly connected to the storage machine through InfiniBand so we have throughput of about 500 megabytes per second on each node um, and that's what, that was another reason why we weren't so entirely convinced that OpenMax is the way to go. Because if we, if we kind of, if we push like the button and fire out the pipeline, that, that performance goes down to maybe 50 megabytes per second. Um, so we needed kind of this very tightly connected high throughput. Uh, but what, what, what file system are you using? We're currently using a normal NFS. Uh, okay. The next stage would be to, to move that over to something more parallel. Yeah, so because uh, what, 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 uh, we have been using this before, and now we are using Fraunhofer file system. So I okay. think this one would be uh, yeah. for the performance of you. Yeah, absolutely, I, I, I agree. So the file system is currently one of those things I'm looking at. Thanks a lot.